the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. The last couple of weeks we have been um, speaking about the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ uh, to the earth, His divine incarnation. And we spoke about it primarily as the unmerited gift, the seed that is sown by the sower on the land. So today the church appoints for us a gospel that completes this picture for us. We all know that the major feasts of the church, such as the Nativity of our Lord, um, those feasts were the highlights of the year for early Christians. They were the first kind of backbone of the entire year. And the church, over time, began to build this lectionary, these selections of Bible readings, these gospel readings that we read every Sunday, to complete the picture for us. And while one side of this equation is the coming of our Lord, His condescension and His compassion towards humanity coming, and we saw this meditated upon in the parable of the sower, the other side of this equation is our own going out to meet Him and our own deliberate action, our own choice to respond to this coming and to prepare adequately for His coming into our lives, His encounter, whether historically in His incarnation, whether mystically in His sacraments, in His body and blood, or whether we encounter Him in the mystery of the other. Whenever we see somebody else, whenever we meet somebody else who is created in God's image and we encounter Christ in their face. This gospel is about preparation, about motivating us to begin our fast for the nativity, to prepare adequately for this, and to, take our, to, to reorient our spiritual lives towards receiving Him into our hearts, into our lives, into our minds. So this gospel, which brings these images into our consideration, the image, for example, of someone who builds a tower and has to plan accordingly, to plan adequately with wisdom and take into consideration all the resources at their disposal. Or the image of someone planning a war and how he has to be very careful in his planning and how he has to be very deliberate and purposeful in how he utilizes his resources. All these images are important for our consideration as we begin this journey of the fast of the Holy Nativity. <laughs> Incidentally, this gospel is uh, appointed also in a couple of other occasions throughout the year. The image of the tower, which always reminds us of the cross of our Savior, uh, recommends this gospel to be prayed on the third day of the Feast of the Cross. Also, the image of the tower reminds the church historically of an entire class of saints known as stylites. Stylites are the ones that, that are reach such heights in their asceticism that they spent their lives on top of pillars. The word stylos in Greek means something of a pillar or an elevated rock formation, something of that sort. And there are several known stylite saints in our uh, Synexarion, uh, such as Saint Agathon, Saint Luke the stylite, Saint Simeon the stylite, and they all chose to, li to live lives not just as monks living in community, not just uh, persevering in uh, chastity and asceticism in what eventually in the fourth century became a very common means of doing so, but to go even beyond that, to literally build themselves a tower and to be motivated thereby to live on top of those towers, dedicating their lives to Christ. But one of the first statements that we hear in this gospel are perhaps shocking and scandalizing to many. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Shocking and scandalizing, not just when taken out of context, but even for, those, for, for, for most of us who know Christ, who have known not just Jesus Christ in his incarnation, but God in his dealing with his people of Israel throughout the Old Testament. Remember that the first two commandments that God gave to the people of Israel on Mount Sinai are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so it comes as a shock then to hear the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of love, come and preach that you should hate your father, your mother, 
wife and children, brothers and sisters, even your own life, or else you cannot be his disciple. But uh, in a different context, speaking essentially the same, the same teaching, but a different gospel in the gospel of St. Matthew, uh, the words come to us slightly differently and therefore shed light on what the Lord actually intended to say. Whoever loves his own father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And the key word is more than me. Throughout the Old Testament, um, the Lord, in giving commandments to the people of Israel, there were a lot of uh, encounters or a lot of scenes in the first five books of Moses, the Torah, that seemed to have behind them a lesson to teach the people of Israel to prioritize their obedience to the law over everything else, even over their own sense of belonging to a community, their own sense of family or tribe or even belonging to the people of Israel. So you find, for example, stories of um, individuals who perhaps committed sins, disobeyed the law in some fashion, and oftentimes you find that the lesson behind the story is that others who know about them should report them. And having reported them, they were not forgiven. They were killed in accordance to the law. So the story often seems to imply that one should prioritize their obedience to the law than even their love and their commitment and their dedication to their own family. And you find people going to Moses the prophet, for example, reporting, I know who did this. And then they, they find out about them and they are punished. But this was God's way of slowly and gradually teaching his children to prioritize not so much obedience to a written law, but obedience first and foremost to him. Commitment, love, and dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ above all else. It's not so much about either or, but it's about where our priorities stand ultimately if we have to be pushed to that level. It's not so much about loving others versus loving God, because loving God and loving neighbor are two intimately connected things in our faith. The first thing is that our love for God, if it's truly authentic, if it's truly fervent, should always compels us to love our neighbor, to love God's creation, the crown of which is his humanity. Humankind was created in God's image and his likeness. And so any authentic, any true, serious love for God must by necessity lead us then to love one another. Not just father or mother or wife and, and husband or brothers and sisters in the flesh, but brothers and sisters broadly defined. But the other side of this coin is the one that's perhaps trickier and, and uh, often we fail to, first of all, acknowledge it, but also live up to it. And that is any true, authentic love of neighbor has to be grounded in Christ for it to be true. There is no real love away from Christ. There is no real love away from taking his example first and foremost. We love others the way that God loved us. And that is quite a standard to live up to quite a standard because if you consider it in this, in this seriousness, in this essential nature of what love really is, God is love. So therefore love is God. If you consider it that way, we, it's hard for us to imagine that we have ever loved truly, that we have ever loved as we really should love. Otherwise, our attempts at love, our attempts at loving others are always essentially lacking Christ, and if they are, then they are essentially fraudulent, then they are artificial attempts at love. Entertaining in the same way that maybe kids can play dress up sometimes and pretend they are somebody they are not, and it's only entertaining as long as performer and audience understand that this is really not so. Even David the prophet in the Psalms, David who is a man after God's own heart, says in Psalm 114, I am filled with love. Why? For the Lord has heard the voice of my supplication. Even David had a motive. Even David, in his imperfect humanity, although he was one of the closest to God, his love was not entirely um, free of motive. 
He says, I'm filled with love because the Lord heard the voice of my supplication. But what if he didn't? Would I still love him? Would I still attach myself to him and adhere to him and regard myself truly as his son and daughter even when he doesn't hear or seemingly doesn't do what I'm supplicating him for? <clears throat> True love is grounded in Christ and this is especially a, a sensitive issue for in the lives of young men and women in our church. And I know I'm getting into sensitive territory at this point. I have heard the, our youth had a very productive, very fruitful conversation with our servants the last couple of weeks um, about love, dating, relationships, and so forth. And I'm not gonna hear, coming here to add or to, uh, to take away from anything that was said. I actually don't know what was said. Um, but I will just give you what I feel is my most kind of distilled uh, advice or insight about this that I can offer you in this context. And that is, work on your love for Christ first. Work on your own relationship with God before anything else. We often reach a certain age in our lives where we feel ready. We feel responsible. We feel that we have reached a point where we are capable of love, real love. But the fact of the matter is that unless we have modeled that love comparable to the love of Christ for us, the love of Christ for his church, then again, that attempt at love that we have is at best something that might develop in the future into true love, if properly nurtured, if properly protected, if properly guarded by everyone involved. It's a, at best a good idea that, good, that could develop well in the future but could also develop very badly if not guarded and if not modeled against the love of Christ for his church and if not the love of Christ is the priority in our relationships. A lot of examples in history are about this love that might seem sometimes um, to be an example of what the Lord is talking about in the gospel, hating mother and father or, or sister and brother. A lot of examples in our lives of the saints have the same effect. Remember, for example, Saint Demiana, whose father sacrificed to the idols and therefore obtained a very good position in the government, the position of governor. And she went to him and didn't congratulate him, something that in human terms would be expected, something that would be loving out of in, in a human context, but she prioritized her love for God and said, I wish to would have seen you dead than to have seen you reject or renounce your faith in Christ. And what happened as a result of that? Again, in human terms, he was remorseful and he went back, re recanted, and returned back to his faith in Christ. And as an ultimate result, he was martyred. He died. One can even say he ultimately died because his daughter guilted him. But in terms of the love of God for his church, she was very loving towards him. Because you see, like I said earlier, true love for neighbor, true love for mother, father, sister, or brother has to be grounded in our love for Christ. And it flows out of it, holds it as its standard upon which to act. So Saint Demiana did not um, prioritize human connections. She did not foreground her love for her father, but foregrounded her love for God, and therefore saved not only herself and her relationship with Christ, but even her own father's relationship with Christ because he ended up gaining the crown of martyrdom and ultimately entering the kingdom of heaven because of his witness to the faith. Many other saints did the same thing. There's an entire class of female saints in our church that have rejected their family connections and decided to go into the desert and become ascetics. Saint Anastasia is one of those. Saint Ilaria is also one of those. Two saints whose stories are very similar that they come from very privileged backgrounds. And uh, you can imagine what kind of connections and affection they must have had for their family. But they decided to reject all of this and prioritize their love for God uh, and, and pursue an ascetic career in the desert. These examples are not given to us as recipes. The church is not saying you should do the same thing yourself, leave your family and go live far away by yourself and try to be a saint. These are given as idealized examples of a certain way of life. 
that worked in a particular context for this particular saint. And especially in, in our monastic tradition, uh, gives this sort of idealized, absolute, distilled example of what it means to prioritize love for God, even sometimes at the expense of connections with, uh, with family, with friends, with loved ones, and so forth. St. Arsenius is known for that, right? He's the one that, that humorously wanted to give advice, or when he was asked to give advice to Pope Theophilus, he told him, you really want a piece of advice from me? Yeah? Stay away from Arsenius. Otherwise, don't talk to me. I'm here to worship. I'm here on a mission to be with God. I'm not here to give advice. I'm not here to entertain uh, 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 elevated guests, even the Patriarch of Alexandria. Right? But in another narrative, in another take on this virtue, um, we hear him speaking to his disciple Mark. And he says, I love everyone. But for me to be with everyone, I can't be with God, so I have to choose. That's his personality. Not everyone was like that, of course. Some are called after a life of asceticism to share their virtue and to share their teachings, like St. Anthony, staying away from everyone for a while, but then coming back and sharing his virtues with the church, with his disciples. The means may vary. The means are different. But the, the common denominator in all of these stories that began as oral tradition, not as firm texts meant to report news. But the common denominator in all of this is prioritizing the love of God above all else uh, in our journey towards Him. The lesson for us essentially is to be deliberate in our, in our spiritual life. Be deliberate, be planning, be decisive. And that is the message that we receive today in the very first Sunday of our Nativity Fast. The Church wants to reorient us to guide us again onto the track so that we can begin this journey of serious, decisive preparation, such as building a building or such as planning for war. And it is indeed war. War not against others, not against, as many seem to think, against culture or against uh, poor politics or against society, but against yourself first and foremost, against your passions, against your base, lusts and desires for yourself. Be deliberate. And we heard last week from Abuna Bishoy especially about confession. We all need guides. We all need guides in the spiritual life to give us this sense of direction, this sense of purpose. And it doesn't matter if you are young, if you're old, if you are a deacon or a priest or a, a layman or woman, we all need guides in our spiritual life, especially in this season, to re-guide ourselves onto this path so that we can receive the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of the season, not just as passive soil. And we heard last week about how we all have the same soil, we all received from God the same soil, but not just as, as, as a passive recipient of a gift, but as someone who is willing to go out there and meet the guest that is coming. This season is all about preparation. People are putting up decorations, Christmas trees, uh, um, seeing all sorts of uh, light decorations throughout their neighborhoods and it's all about preparing and buying presents and so forth but let your preparation also be interior above all else focus on that spend some time on that this is what God desires most of you not that you put up a, a, a nice Christmas tree not that you put up very joyful uh, uh, decorations not that you bought all the right presents for all the right kids in the family and not that you've put up you know, a Christmas feast and invited everybody and was generous. Above all else, it's whether you are preparing through repentance. You are preparing through taking your spiritual life more seriously. You are preparing through confession. You are preparing by examining yourself in light of the love of Christ for us and for His church. So that way when we eventually meet the Lord Jesus Christ, we meet him historically. He came and was incarnate in our world uh, once and for all, as we know. But we also meet him weekly on the altar in his body and blood. And we also meet him in the face of our brothers and sisters throughout the world. And we also meet him in his word, in his holy scripture. All these are different levels of encounter with the incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. And when we meet him in all of these contexts, having prepared fully and well, then we can meet him not like strangers, 
Not like once who are uh, seeing someone strange for the very first time, but as real children, sons and daughters of our incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen.